Cabaret's masterful score doesn't just accompany the story of 1930s Berlin, it is the story, and in this story, won't ravel how. Welcome and bienvenue. Welcome. Fremde. Etranger. Stranger. Its music is so powerful and evocative that it almost becomes a character of its own, capturing the mood in a way that's unforgettable. This is one of the reasons Cabaret has stood the test of time, remaining a favorite in musical theater for decades, including one of my favorites. If you caught my last video on Chicago, you know how much I admire Kander and Ebb's work. I was reminded just how rich and complex the music is in this show after seeing the recent West End revival of Cabaret in London this past summer. It was a fantastic experience and a refreshing production that they envisioned to be more topical for today's audiences. I had also watched the famous Alan Cumming as MC, Sam Mendes version of Cabaret when it was revived on Broadway in 2014. Emma Stone played Sally Bowles. It was also breathtakingly wonderful to watch. I don't recall how I felt about Emma Stone as Sally Bowles, except that her British accent was distractingly inconsistent. There's plenty of content out there about Cabaret, but in this five-part video series, I'm diving into something that often gets overlooked, how the music itself tells the story and heightens every emotion on stage. And in this video, we'll be looking at the musical background of Cabaret, and then looking how the opening song sets the scene for the rest of the musical. So first, the background. Set in 1930s Berlin as the Nazi party rises to power, Cabaret follows the life of Cliff Bradshaw, a young American writer, and Sally Bowles, an English cabaret singer at the Kit Kat Club. As the world outside becomes more dangerous, the club's lively and decadent atmosphere provides a sharp contrast to the growing tension. Also a subplot of the dangerous love between the older Fräulein Schneider, a landlady, and her Schultz, a Jewish fruit vendor. Cabaret is inspired by Christopher Isherwood's Goodbye to Berlin and John Van Druten's play I Am the Camera. The musical, with its score by composer John Kander and lyricist Fred Ebb, premiered on Broadway in 1966, featuring a book by Joe Masteroff and direction by the iconic Hal Prince. John Kander researched the sounds of 1920s to 30s German jazz and popular music while writing this work. One composer who embodies this era is Kurt Weill, whose innovative fusion of classical and popular styles alongside sharp social commentary marked the music of this era in Germany. Collaborating with playwright Bertolt Brecht, Weill created groundbreaking works like the Three Penny Opera, using jazz, cabaret, and dissonant harmonies to mirror the turbulent social landscape of the time. Notably, Kander has stated he deliberately avoided listening to Weill's music during his research. I very consciously didn't listen to Kurt Weill. Kurt Weill was doing very early on what I was doing many years later. He was really using the vernacular of that period. However, many of the songs shared the same sort of vibe and cynicism of Kurt Weill's music, and Kanda remained worried about the audience's perception. As the production was mounted, they were able to secure the amazing performer Lotha Lenya, who was Kurt Weill's wife, to play Fräulein Schneider. Lotha Lenya's performances of Kurt Weill's music, especially in the Three Penny Opera, made her a central figure in Germany's Weimar era cabaret scene and had a lasting impact on the country's musical theater scene. Kander told her, When the reviews come out, I know that they're going to say that I was cribbing from Kurt Weill, but I just want you to know that that was never my intention. I remember she took my head in her hands and said, No, no, it's not Kurt. When I'm out on that stage, it's Berlin that I hear when I sing your songs. This greatly reassured Kander. Kander hasn't shared some specifics of what he listened to in getting into the mindset of the musical, except for composer Friedrich Hollander. Friedrich Hollander was a prominent German composer and songwriter known for his cabaret and film music during the Weimar Republic, most famously for writing Falling in Love Again for the 1930 film The Blue Angel. I often stop and wonder why I appeal to men. Author James Levy, who wrote about Kander and Ebb, also listed the pianist Peter Kruger as a related influence. Though I think he meant Peter Kruder, who was a German-Austrian pianist and composer who became famous for his jazz-influenced film scores in the 30s and 40s, such as the aforementioned The Blue Angel. Though there are other clear genres of music that were of influence to Kander, such as beer garden drinking songs, polkas, German leader art songs, and Nazi anthems. We'll talk about those later. 
Kander said in an interview later that the score of Cabaret is all about the minor second. The minor second is the smallest interval that would get in the Western scale. From here to here to here to here. These are all minor seconds. It's also called half steps or usually if there's a series of them together called chromatics. For this video, I'll be mostly referring to these instances of minor seconds as chromatics. Chromatics were generally used sparingly in more traditional theory as they are not part of the diatonic scale of the key being played. You can see only two half steps in the tonality here and here of the scale. In the early 1930s when cabaret was taking place, chromatics were still used sparingly in popular music, though creeping in into more classical music through the impressionists such as Ravel and Debussy. As a result, the use of chromatics in cabaret is very deliberate. Kander's deliberate use of chromatics throughout cabaret score creates a persistent sense of unease and instability, mirroring the discomforting political climate and moral ambiguity of 1930s Berlin while keeping the audience on edge. I'll point out the instances, especially significant moments, where chromatics are used to help enhance the musical storytelling. Right at the beginning of the first song, we have a great example of chromatics already in the beginning dominating the melody and up into the welcome. Welcome. Over here on welcome, not only do we have a chromatic, we also have an appoggiatura. Appoggiaturas have similarities to chromatics. They are a musical ornament that consists of a non-chord tone played before a main note, creating a dissonance that resolves into the harmony, typically by stepping down or up into the target note. These notes will generally fall into a strong beat in order to emphasize the dissonance. So in this case, we have an F sharp, which isn't part of the B flat tonality, falling on the strong B, but then chromatically resolving to the G, which, though isn't part of the B flat chord, is still part of the tonality. This chord here, though, is called a sixth chord because it is a typical major triad of 1, 3, 5, but with the sixth scale degree added. Although Kander conscientiously didn't draw influence from Kurt Weill's music, comparisons cannot be avoided. One of Kurt Weill's most famous song, Mac the Knife, opens his 1928 German musical The Three Penny Opera. The song starts out and is dominated also by these six chords as well. Anyways, this welcome is part of a chromatic melodic pattern that precedes it, from the A to the B flat. It is debatable if this is a true appoggiatura, as the non-chord tone doesn't fall on the strong beat. Kander and Ebb wrote the opening song first, as they felt it was important to set the tone for approaching writing the rest of the musical. In the same interview, Kander even cites Sondheim as saying something similar. Saying that the first song was written first seems obvious, but other composers approach the first song differently. For instance, Maury Yeston, who wrote such musicals as Nine and Titanic, says he saves the first song for writing last. As now he's written everything else, he knows how to set it up with the opening song. From start to end, Wielkelman does a brilliant job of setting up the evening in tone, story, characters, genre, and language. Speaking of which, the MC sings in German, French, and English. This is done to emphasize the international quality that Berlin had at the time. Also inspired when Kander visited Tivoli Park in Copenhagen and encountered a performance in which the MC also introduced the acts in three languages. We continue to have chromatic sprinkle throughout the song. At the end of the song, we have a prominent and exclusively chromatic line played by the trumpet ascending towards the end, while the bass line descends chromatically towards the end. The first song is strange as the musical immediately begins without an overture, which is unheard of in its time. All we get is a long drum roll, a crash of a cymbal, and a pregnant pause to get our attention. Then we launch into the accompaniment vamp with this iconic rhythm. Remember this rhythm though as it will make several appearances later in the musical. Though this introduction of first song serves exactly as an overture would do, it grabs our attention and sets the mood without launching into the story. It is absolutely appropriate that the score and world of cabaret would be dominated by these chromatics. The chromatic notes are a bit perverse, indecisive at times, and thus serves to enhance the sense of unease and instability. As we've seen, Kander and Ebb's careful research and thoughtful composition have created a piece that not only beautifully represents the era's musical style, but also foreshadows the darker themes to come. Wielkelman invites the audience into the Kit Kat Club, but it also serves as a warning. 
a glimpse into a world where nothing is quite as it seems, where political tensions simmer beneath the surface, and where the line between entertainment and reality becomes increasingly blurred. As we continue to explore Cabaret's score, we'll see how these musical themes established in the opening number continue to develop and deepen. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe and stay tuned for part 2 coming soon. Also, please consider supporting my channel by either becoming a free or paid patron on my Patreon, where members get theater-related thoughts and updates. Thank you for watching.